didn't see graduation in Zero Tillage. So there's something to unpack there, um, why there has been that graduation. And so to our second medal ceremony of Surfsea for autonomous adoption of the mechanical rice transplanter in bronze, we have Kushida Malda in silver meddling again. We have Vijanandapur Malda and in gold position we have Chandamoni Malda sweeping the podium. Well done to our team in Malda for their excellent work. Now for surface seeding, which we only explored in Malda, what we see is um, like the other technologies, there's still a lot of unawareness and unfamiliarity. But what we do see is limited support, but a lot of periodic use. When we come to the pathway analysis, we can see a few things. The first one, that blue E pathway, there hasn't been a lot of support for surface seeding in the communities that we looked at. Surprisingly also, there's a lot of stopped use, those red lines there. However, that's often leading to periodic use. This is something that we didn't see in the other CASI practices and needs further exploration. So now we know where we are. One of the key questions we have is why we are here. So this next section tries to unpack, is CASI valid? Is it working for farmers in the EGP? First up, we looked at 15 different livelihood activities that have changed through CASI. What we found is overwhelmingly farmers are benefiting, not hugely, but they are benefiting. Roughly 10% of the survey respondents across each of those 15 showed that they were actually disadvantaged, which is not huge. The exception there is drudgery. In the main, it is working for people. Perhaps more importantly is the collective benefit that comes across these 15 different factors. Now what we can see is in the majority of cases, farmers are getting 12, 13, 14 or even 15 out of 15 benefits uh, from CASI. This is however noticeably lower in Samsari and in Rungpo. Of course that doesn't tell the story of why people choose not to use CASI. So what we did was compare the current livelihood constraints of those who have never used CASI machinery on the left with CASI users who have experienced benefits on the right. And what we find is that they are correlated, that the challenges that farmers are facing do match with the benefits that CASI is providing. Now just a few other things to pick out about the benefits of CASI. The first one is that we actually found that CASI enables crop and livestock diversification and intensification, about 80% for both regionally. Um, and really important, I think, that CASI can be an enabler of crop diversification. The second point to pick out is around the argument that CASI is not a yield increasing technology. Now, what we can see from this is that in the majority of cases, it's not yield decreasing, but it can actually be yield increasing, particularly looking at the different locations, such as Coach Fierha. Also, some crops tend to go better than others, and some machinery is doing better than others. So there is diversity there, but overall, it is yield positive. But of course, now we've said that adoption is low, but the technology is great. So that leads us to the question, why aren't we seeing larger amounts of adoption? We can look at constraints to uptake in three broad categories. The first one, information. The second one, access to machinery. And the third one, in terms of performance of the technology. What we see from this is that information seems to be a common constraint across the region and likewise access to machinery. However, performance issues, while present, tend to be for specific issues in specific locations. Let's first unpack the information gap that's been identified. And of course, one element of that is awareness. What we can see is there are some regionally specific trends that are occurring over time. However, we do see India with much substantially higher awareness rates than, say, Nepal and Bangladesh. When we look at the same thing, the mechanical rice transplanter, we notice similar trends, meaning that the information systems 
are roughly consistent across technologies. Now, awareness is one element, but so is understanding. What you're looking at here is the self-identified level of understanding of passive. There's not a lot of green there. And what that tells us is that even if you are aware of PASI, you tend not to have a very good understanding of what PASI is. To test this out, we asked those that said they were aware of PASI to tell us if the Rotovator, Laser Land Leveler, and Happy Seeder were PASI technologies. That is, do we understand the principles of zero tillage? What we can see is that across the region generally, there was a pretty poor understanding of CASI machinery and CASI principles. Now what becomes interesting is when we look at information gaps by typology. Now we would expect that the unaware, the unfamiliar, and even the non-users would have a limited understanding of CASI. What's interesting though is current users and even currently supported users are still identifying information gaps. And that tells us that this, this information gap is causing a constraint to the scaling of CASI across the region. Now let's unpack the access gap that's been identified. What, what we can see here is that across a lot of different machinery, there is access issues. And in fact, there is less identification of access issues for zero tillage and strip tillage and mechanical rice transplanters, with the exception of Sumsari and for the rice transplanter, run for. However, when we asked farmers to identify how many service providers they could find in their local area for the different machinery, what we found is that for the rotivator and for the combine harvester, the numbers were substantially higher than for the other machinery. This was further reinforced when we asked how many of those service providers were actually reliable. This means that there is a vibrant service provision economy for some machinery like the rotivator and the combine harvester, but there isn't yet that for the CASI equipment. This is a really rich data set and there's so much that we can do with it. But as always, the Circe ceremony, ceremonial bell is ever present. So let's pick out a few key elements to inform future scaling. And the first one is learning from the effectiveness of previous capacity development initiatives. So what we're looking at here is a comparison of those who have been trained as compared to those who are aware but have not taken training. There's a few things that we can find. The first one is that interest is lower in the trained. That is, it's not just people are interested, but they are progressing to higher typologies of use. One of the interesting findings here, though, is that 15% of the familiar yet untrained population were actually receiving financial support but had never taken training. So there's something to unpack on what's going on there. However, when we look at overall outcome, and particularly what we want is um, constant use, those that are trained are four times as likely to be constant users than those that are not trained. So it suggests that training on the zero till and strip till machinery is working. So great, training works, but we want to learn who gave the most effective training. So what we did is we broke down the organizational type of the training organization to start to look at who was getting the most constant users as a proportion of people trained. What we find is that businesses for the zero tillage drill and strip tillage machinery were getting the best outcomes of constant users per trained individual. However, that might also be a reflection that they gave the most support in that process. When we look at cooperatives, comparatively high, but a much lower conversion from support into constant use. So there's something worth exploring there. And if COVID hadn't got to us, we would have been able to go and understand why these trends were occurring. When we look at the mechanical rice transplant, as we've said, a lot less support. We do find that the most successful training organizations were cooperatives. One of the things that I'm finding quite interesting about this data set and that I'd love to explore more is that we can actually identify the best performing training organizations, both in terms of uh, those that 
had a high ratio of trained progressing to use and those that are currently unassisted. And we can see that across the two technologies here. Interesting to go a little bit deeper and understand why certain organisations were having better outcomes than others. We haven't had a chance to do that and because of COVID. Uh, in the space of surfacy, I don't think we will be able to do that. So a little bit of a missed opportunity there. Now for me, this is one of the most interesting parts of the survey and I'm really sad that I don't have time to do it justice. But we started to explore the information systems that, were, that farmers were using for CASI and other machinery. So what we have here on the left hand side is the current main information source for zero tillage and strip tillage machinery and on the right their preferred main source of information. And what we can see is regionally most people have the same current and preferred source though other farmers are probably overrepresented as a main source of information. But where it gets interesting is when we look at each region individually. So let's take Sunsari, for instance. The green there is other farmers. Now that's about 30% of the population who have their main source as other farmers. But when we look at the preference, it's much, much lower. In fact, in Sunsari and in the eastern Holtarai, we see that while government extension is a really minor source of information, that's how farmers would want to receive their information. And that has some strong implications for scaling strategies. If we look across at Kuchbihar, you can see that, and in Rangpur, you can see that international NGOs are really strongly preferenced uh, and seen as a main source of information, whereas in other locations, it's much smaller. In, in Rashahi, we can see that government extension is really, really dominant, yet in Kuchbihar, it's much, much lower. So there are these really interesting regional differences that come about when we start to look at this. The same way where in Malda, farmer groups are really preferenced, whereas in other locations like Rangpur, Rajahi in Bangladesh, they're not. This is really important to developing scaling strategies. So we're starting to unpack who are the best organisations, so the most effective organisations, what types of organisations are most effective, where is information coming from and where is it preferenced to come from? What that then leads us to is, okay, what topics, what information should be a priority to use these new channels that we understand? So when we asked farmers about the topics that they demanded for zero tillage and mechanical rice transplanter training, what we can see is that Sunsari sits itself apart from the others. The four other locations are, are more or less similar, maybe Rajahi a little bit uh, different from the other three. But Sunsari definitely wants more introductory material, whereas the other locations have a mix of different topics that they'd like training on. Now, likewise, when asked on who should give the training, again, we see some regional differences that are occurring, very much in Bangladesh, two very different scenarios from each other and from the rest of the region. Malda, Kuchbihar, Sunsari, tending to really focus on government extension and farmer groups, whereas Rangpur, tendency to look for NGOs, and in Rashahi, almost exclusively asking for government extension. So again, this is really important to how future scaling should be designed. To round out our learnings from this so far, there's two sustainability elements to explore. Now the first one is, who will support the scaling of CASI once the project has ended? The survey identified 82 organisations that have supported CASI across the region. Of these, 63 have supported the zero tillage drill, 67 the mechanical rice transplanter, and 12 have supported surface seeding in Malta. West Bengal definitely has the most organisations of around 50. Only, the, the interesting thing here is that only 29% of the identified organisations supporting CASI were actually associated with SURFC. So it does indicate that it's not just SURFC keeping the boat afloat. Only five organisations were identified by farmers that were working across multiple geographies and none of the organisations identified were working across more than one country. For the zero tillage drill, technical assistance was the primary support mechanism with 38 organisations identified. 
following by seed inputs, machinery, and training. The other key aspect of sustainability is if farmers believe that the government is supporting them to use PASI practices. Across the region, respondents tend to think that the government did want them to use zero tillage and strict tillage machinery, and to a lesser extent, the rice mechanical rice transplanter. This was regionally different though, with Bangladesh having the highest and Malta having the lowest. Of those people that thought that, there was across the region a relatively strong perception that the government was providing support to use these machines. Now this is important when we think about sustainability. If farmers think that the government wants them to do it, they are more inclined, and especially if they think support is there, to take Cassie. So just to recap on this data analysis narrative, we've learned where things have worked and where things haven't worked. We've confirmed Cassie in farmers' fields through farmers' experiences as having multiple different benefits. We've identified some of these roadblocks that are constraining use and what we can do about them. And we've also identified who's going to be able to support and scale once the project finishes. But I think really importantly, what we haven't been able to do is analyse all of the data that we actually do have, because there's so much more we can learn from this data set. In terms of the data collected that we haven't yet analysed, we can still explore ownership issues, process and experiences and service provision. We have residue data and how that plays into decision making. We have temporal data on the adoption process for each adopter. Importantly, there's two aspects here, particularly around definitions and nuance around what is CASI in the EGB, particularly around the three elements and components that are traditionally packaged for CASI, as well as intensity of use of those different components and how that packages together. Finally, we also have now the different locations and unpacking these differences. In terms of deepening our understanding, all of the statistical significance in our results, we still need to define that out. We also have our various regressions that help us understand relationships between the data points. And finally, we haven't yet extrapolated what all of these results mean at a regional level, particularly between our original scale out and non surfsy node. And that can really help us to piece together a more regional impact assessment. However, there are two key things that we need to prioritize in this data set. The first one is that we have a lot of gender disaggregated data, both for the spouse of male headed households and female headed households. And there's huge potential for learnings to come out of this. The second one is that SURFC has put a lot of work into ADOPT and we have the data now to do some really meaningful validations. So what we really need is some dedicated time to finish this off. COVID caused this delay and we really had hoped to have this survey done even two years ago, and we just couldn't get there. All of these learnings, we've got the data, we just need some dedicated time to finish it off. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brendan, for your presentation. Just, um, just a few notes there. I can see people typing in the chat for clarifications. Whenever I touch the chat, the video goes off the screen. So I'm gonna to have to find a way to try and answer those uh, without interrupting the video. So. I'll come back to you for, for some of those answers, but just to, to say that it is a very initial analysis. We actually only finished cleaning this data a few weeks ago. So we've rushed through and tried to present something to this final meeting. Okay, so what we're going to do now is hear from different regional locations around convergence and sustainability. And my computer is doing funny things again. Give me a moment, sorry. So what we have is the joys of technology. Hopefully my screen is going to stop sharing. There. Yeah. Let me try that all again. Apologies. 
we're going to hear from each of our partners about the status of convergence and sustainability in their locations. We've given them seven to 10 minutes, and we're going to go first to West Bengal and hear from Dr. Pratik from UBKV. Good morning, everybody. Today, I am here to present partial but successful implementation of policy favoring Kasi in West Bengal. The team, since inception, worked on fine balance of different skill sets to bring out a stepwise progress towards increased uptake of the technology in the state. As soon as we realized the benefits of Kasi is not only in economics, but also in environmental issues, we started dialogues with the state on policy implementation. While showcasing the accrued benefits out of the state technology, which included productivity, profitability, labor, water use, energy, and environmental footprints. Basically, we pleaded on three pronged benefits. One, directly to the farming communities. Second was the need of such technologies for being climate smart. And third, it opens a scope to the micro entrepreneurs for development in the communities. Partial implementation of CA policy is evident from acceptance of the protocols local level convergence of the flagship programs. However, a full-fledged policy is required to bring confidence to the ground level workers implementing the technology. More important step government has taken is to include the CA machineries in the compulsory list of proposals seeking incentives for custom hiring centers. Supporting CA training and uh, machine testing center uh, in the university is also a big step taken to make the CHCs more viable in the future. Policy issues raised by the team mainly revolved around inclusion of CASI in state plan, dedicated training and machine testing center, convergence of different flagship programs, inclusion of shear machinery in the incentive schemes, coordination of different departments for residue management and provision of incentives to the farmers for adoption. Seeking policy intervention by the government of West Bengal, the team met with the policymakers in the state and presented them with a policy brief. In the process, apart from three meetings held on January 2017, uh, July 2018, and February 2020, a few visits were also made in the project command area. During the visits, the dignitaries and the policymakers, we tried to present them with field-based evidences and business cases by the micro entrepreneurs. As a result, CA policy was partially adapted, as mentioned earlier, in terms of machinery in compulsory machinery in the custom hiring center convergence uh, to the extent of 18 out of 23 districts of west bengal is under ca through convergence uh, through convergence of flagship programs ubkv also got support for the training and machine testing center it would be better to hear the rest of the story from agriculture advisor to Honorable Chief Minister of West Bengal, Sri Pradeep Majumdar. Well, the SRFSI project that I saw um, right through its um, implementation gives me uh, the confidence that such kind of intervention in a uh, 
small holding, uh, large number farming community is a good way forward to bring in what is most important, the economy of cultivation, quality of uh, production and enhancement of productivity which particularly uh, the factor which um, impressed me the most had been the way uh, it's been done it shows to be very very sustainable it also helped us to enthuse the youths to come forward to take care of um, the uh, need for bringing in uh, new machineries in the farm and uh, government of course intervened and gave them a lot of incentive to um, acquire those kind of machineries. I was really so uh, uh, impressed by seeing their dedication and their sense of business. They have developed it into a business model in collaboration with the custom hiring center whom the government had funded for procuring expensive machineries and then um, let it out to the farming community at a cheaper price. The seedlings are better handled, better managed with motherly care of the lady self-help groups rather than the usual male folk like me who raises it as another process of cultivation. We usually try to copy even from uh, international uh, achievements, but this is happening at home in a northern part of the state. Uh, obviously, our first choice had been to give it a quick spread in the southern part of the state. We are um, not only disseminating the success of, uh, of uh, this particular project, in Kuch Bihar to various districts, more focused on six di districts in South Bengal. A huge challenge that my colleagues, both in the university and in the Department of Agriculture and allied sectors, have taken on themselves to uh, perform and they have been successful. We, I'm grateful that both CIMIT and our um, technologists from Australia had helped us to um, propagate uh, the uh, convergent technologies the best that they thought would be um, suitable for that area. The government of West Bengal will always be very keen to accept such technologies which will help not only development of agriculture but more importantly prosperity of my farming community and the farmers who will continue even after 20 years to keep us alive and still smiling will also smile themselves. With these words from the advisor mentioning a long-term planning favoring the technology infuses hope that the state is moving in right direction to adapt a CA policy in the state plan which will be extremely important for a long-term sustainability through its inclusion in the state budget. That's all from the Team West Bengal for the moment. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Pratik, and the, the team in West Bengal for all the great work and a great presentation there. We're going to move south now uh, into Rangpur and hear from Mamun about the situation there. Hello everyone, welcome to Conversion and Sustainability session. In this session, actually, I'll talk about the policy conversion towards the Kasi. You know, so first I will talk about the National Agriculture Policy 2018, and especially the two areas, the objective of the policy related to the Kasi and its implementation in our location. If you look this, the uh, 
alignment of this um, policy objective at the CASI. A lot of alignment we find out from this National Agriculture Policy 2018. Because of this, the projects have a good uh, contribution during the uh, revision phase of this the policy because the SRPSA projects uh, reviewed this existing policy, find out the policy gaps and the policy direction. They try to fit the policy makers and uh, during this uh, sharing of the policy briefs, uh, organize their field workshops and also the field findings. Uh, findings. So that's why the good reflection we observe in this um, existing National Agricultural Policy 2018. And not only the, you know, sharing the policy gaps, you know, policy revisions, these projects also work for this and the policy implementation. So that's why we very closely work with this, all these NARS Institute and also the universities, NGOs uh, and in these areas through their you know, the innovation platform and, say, and also the coordination, cooperation, meetings, uh, learning sharings. And we found the uh, good achievements uh, in the four areas, particularly the field research. Many research is done um, regarding the variety development, crop diversification, intensification, and also the agricultural machineries by the BWMRI, Bari, uh, BRI, INGUS and universities in these areas. But the technology transfer, DAE, wafer the INGO and RDRS is working. And for the farm mechanizations, a lot of projects is taken by the DAE, RDRS, private sector in these areas. And now we are talking about this uh, conservation agriculture uh, as a specialized agriculture by the DAE, INGO, and RDRS. And second uh, policy is a uh, national agricultural mechanization, mechanization policy. This project is a direct contribution for the formation of this project. This is a very new projects and uh, new policies. Uh, so projects uh, what to formulate these you know, policies. And if you look this, uh, the uh, objective of the policy has a good linkage with this CASI and I say, you know, the good achievements and of this implementation of uh, these policies and uh, particularly the um, extension of agricultural machineries and skill developments. So big projects is done by this DA 30,200 million is so a five years projects. In these projects, 56,000 machineries unit will be distributed among this, uh, you know, the um, farm families. And on the other end, the research development, body, you know, uh, 560 million projects, uh, research projects has taken. BRI is also uh, 440 million projects is taken. And university, particularly the BU, uh, they are also uh, did the many research activities, private sector, particularly SEI, you know, metal, uh, hawk corporations, they are also investing money for the research of the missionaries. And in the area of the expansion of manufacturing industries, a lot of local manufacturing come forward and also bigger companies are uh, there importing some machineries. In the credit support, you know, the bank, Bangladesh uh, Agricultural Bank, Russia, Kishi Union Bank, MFI, they are also giving the uh, credit to the farmers to buy the machineries. And third to the policy, um, agricultural uh, extension policy, this is the new policies. So, and the projects, particularly SFSA projects, has a good contribution to formulation and the revision of this project, you know, the policies. And a lot of uh, alignment is also here. And based on that, DAE, um, they are implementing mechanization of agriculture through integrated management projects that I already discussed. 
So another project, IFMC project. And very interesting and so one uh, initiative taken by this uh, GA, synchronized cultivation under the agricultural incentive program. And another big project is a LGD DA joint projects for the Rockford Division, Agriculture and Rural Development Projects. The World Bank funded projects, National Agriculture Technology Program, NETP2. All they are working for, uh, for the agricultural development in relation to the TASI and good achievements you know, in the current uh, agricultural extension policies district agricultural extension coordination committee they are the playing a very coordinated way to implement all the agricultural you know the technology in these areas ngos particular rdr school comprehensive program they have adopted the kasi technology they are doing syngenta foundation bangladesh they are also working and simit is you know the continuing their activities for this conservation agriculture but uh, we um, believe that the following issues uh, still we have to take seriously for the sustainability of the conservation uh, based sustainable intensification, uh, mainstreaming of the conservation agriculture in the DE program is very, very important. Allocate more cedar machines in ongoing project program of DA because less number of the cedar machine has allocated. On the other machineries, thresher harvester number is very high. And we uh, need to develop more agricultural machinery service provider being an entrepreneur. And capacity building of the agricultural machineries, manufacturing industries. Uh, should be done by the body, BW, MRI, and private sector. Research on agricultural mechanization and cropping system could be continued by body and BW, MRI. Uh, increased participation youth and women in agriculture is very, very important. So existing DA and NGOs programs should consider seriously. Engagement of the private sector and good coordinations among the stakeholders should be led by the DAE, uh, where nurse institute, NGO, private sector can contribute, can participate. Uh, thank you for listening to me. All right, thank you so much, Mamun, uh, for an excellent overview there. Also great to see in the chats, uh, pretty vibrant conversation coming through. So people, please do keep putting your ideas, your reflections, uh, and keep that discussion going as we listen to our next uh, presenter coming uh, and to talk about Rashahi. We have Dr. Sharkawat. Welcome to all. My presentation on SRFSA activities in Rajshahi, Bangladesh. Myself, Dr. Mohammad Shakrat Hussain, Senior Scientist, Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute, Bangladesh. Now, what is our current level of policy governance towards Kasi? Firstly, Bangladesh government has developed a policy, namely National Agricultural Mechanization Policy 2020, where conservation agricultural practice is highlighted. And Bangladesh government is providing subsidy for machineries up to 70% and arranged agricultural machinery fair in each year for promoting them. And different government organization have taken projects based on Kasi practice, as for example, farm, farm machinery division body has already finished a project entitled improvement and validation of body cedar for grain crops under different cropping patterns and soils, soil conditions. And another uh, program is running by body, namely farm machineries, technology development for profitable production. And DAE has also started a project named 
agricultural development in Russia division through extension of modern technologies where Gazi technologies included. And some NGOs has also taken the project on Gazi. The CCDP Christian Commission for, uh, for Development in Bangladesh ran a project and used uh, used Gazi practice named capacity building on disaster risk reduction in context of climate change. And they made a very good documentary on Gazi practice. Another NGO, Dasco Foundation, practiced laser leveler technology in their targeted, in their, in their integrated water resource management project. And finally, now in every training session, Gazi practice is discussed among the trainees. And another point, the next steps to ensure sustainability of GASI. I think the machine for, uh, in Bangladesh, the machine perfection, two wheel tractor based attachment is not up to the mark and has less efficiency. The operation of machine is also drudgery and LSPs are not interested to accept this business, its business purpose. So perfect and user-friendly machine is required. And second one, weak dealership network of manufacturers for Gassi machineries is prevailing in Bangladesh. It should be strengthened up to the farmer's door. And capacity building program in different level researchers, extension personnel, manufacturers, mechanics, LSPs, farmers should be continued. And finally, I would like to say project support is essential for field demonstration and escalator decacy. This is all about my presentation. Thank you for question here. Thank you so much, Shakawat, uh, for your uh, quite broad recommendations for next steps. All right, now we're going to, to move across to Bihar. Sorry, I have my slides wrong there. And we're going to hear from Dr. Ram. Namaskar. Now I'm going to present about the convergence and sustainability of Kasi in Bihar. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss about the, what we created kind of collaboration during a SRFSI project. Uh, with this different agencies and programs and followed by I will discuss about how we can make a kind of sustainable model for future. So friends, this journey was started with a lot of a struggle because the area was new Punya. First time we were uh, working for Kasi, promotion of Kasi. So I think uh, initial days, Jivika and SHG groups helped, helped a lot. Especially when we enter through the SHGs, it was a really credible and uh, we uh, started our work. So we developed a kind of collaboration with Jivika and which is having a strong presence and across the Bihar in fact, around 6.4 lakh SHGs are there. Other than that, they are exclusively working by the small and marginal farmers. So in our, uh, in fact, contact farmers, mostly they were very small and marginal farmers. Other than that, they are working for the livelihood generation. So it was a kind of, uh, income generation activities. So on that way, we started our journey and later on, in fact, uh, after some time, Dehat also, we collaborated with Dehat under SRFSI project. And uh, basically they are working for 360 degree solutions, one-stop solutions. They are providing input. They are also trying to use services, different kind of services, advisory also. And uh, they have a two kind of system. One is about the digital, another is about, uh, about uh, offline what we call micro entrepreneurs. So this is a kind of self-sustaining self model and they purchased machineries like land laser, uh, leveler, land laser leveler and uh, other things and acting as a service providers also. Other than that, uh, universities also, uh, SFSI project, we took a lot of technical supports from the universities and we helped also uh, take the, uh, took the services of ICT, other than that, uh, CRA project, it is a mega project. I will discuss, in fact, later on. And other than we have a project like FBIP, which is a 
uh, run by uh, BA Sabar. Other than that, we have a Krishi Vigyan Kendra at uh, local level and uh, they have also strong network. So we also took help from them and uh, they used to conduct a different uh, field day exposure with it and other kinds. So accordingly, we collaborated. Other than that, we have a college in Punia itself and uh, so scientists of that particular college also helped a lot, especially that. So on that way, it was a kind of a system. So under SRPSI project only, we are not only, we are not only just demonstrated the technology or we scaled out or we promoted that technology, but other than that, we tried to develop a kind of platforms, what we call innovation platforms or kind of system, which can at best work for the future. So still Dehat is doing wonderful job and other agencies also doing the things. So the point is that other, uh, in fact, mega programs going on now, like Pharma First programs, it is working in Bhakalpur and uh, Munger districts and promoting about Kasi and other livelihood generation activities. Other than that, there is a mega project of CSV and funded by the government of Bihar. In fact, uh, NABARD as well. So they are promoting about the climate smart agriculture technologies. Other than that, CRA project, I don't think so. Any government uh, is promoting on that way, big way. All the 38 districts of Bihar, this project is running with the collaboration of the different agencies, including BAU Sabor, RPCU PUSA, ICR, BISA, even IRI. So this is a kind of mega project and 100% funded by the state government. So you can understand the sensitivity of the government and uh, now they are only thinking Jal Jeevan Haryali under that project, uh, that program. So this is a project and uh, this is a mega project and lot of demonstration, lot of machinery they are providing to the farming community. Other than that, they are providing subsidy as well. And now we have a BIP project, which is we are trying to understand the role of behavioral economics in adoption process of the CASI technology, especially. And uh, uh, we did about the kind of uh, focus group discussions, household survey, KIIs. Now we are just conducting RCT to understand about actual, uh, the role of uh, behavioral economics in adoption process. So you can see that only the state, Bihar state government is having an agriculture roadmap program. So this is a third roadmap from 2017 to 21. You can see here, these are the targets in this particular roadmap. And like on direct seeded rights, you, you see that total amount it is around uh, uh, 53,500 lakhs rupees allocated for this. They are providing subsidy, uh, 2,000 rupees, and they are giving some different inputs under that. And there are different CASI uh, technologies you can see here, like zero tail HV, zero tail lentil, and uh, other intercropping. So they are having the targets, and they are giving a lot of money. They are pumping a lot of money to just for demonstration, for machinery, for R&D purpose. So friends, if you'd like to sustain this ATS learning and this much of the systems, so for me, like uh, Bihar government at grassroots level, there is a lot of uh, uh, extension functionaries are working and uh, due to, they are not in fact, uh, due to lack of capacity building, they are amenable to execute, there is a policy. There is a mechanism to give them subsidy of the farming community, but if they are only giving that thing only, but they are basically agriculture graduate, if they are able to execute uh, the CASI technology, then I think that will be wonderful thing. So we have to focus in the coming days that we have to focus on that way so we can at least develop a kind of sustaining model. Like the Hath is working wonderful things and other NGOs also. So how we can just attract more number of private sector because these are the based on the business model. They have a kind of sustaining model. They are a profit oriented organization, but yes, they can at least do the long-term business. So that could be a kind of a synergistic approach. Other than that, we can uh, in fact promote a small startups, entrepreneurship or as a service provider uh, that we have at least a uh, few success stories, but yes, we can do many more. And uh, no doubt, research and uh, development institutes, we need to, they, are, they have their own role and how we can collaborate this. 
So ultimately we have to just make collaboration for learning, capacity building, and need to develop a kind of sustaining model, which is a very much required. So with this, we can develop a sustaining model, and I'm sure that is Bihar State is uh, doing a commendable job for promotion of Kasi technology. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Ram there. Um, really enjoyed the, the really clear overview of the policy changes that are occurring in Bihar, so well done. For our final regional presentation, we've got Dr. Ram from the Nepal Department of Agriculture. Hello everyone, uh, good to see you again. Uh, in this presentation, I'll be highlighting some of uh, policy convergence initiatives taken by the Department of Agriculture and sustainability pathway that has emerged. Uh, what we did in the past, uh, what we have done so far, when there was a DADOS uh, working uh, in two districts, project districts, DADOS provided uh, subsidy and cash based machines, uh, mainly JT machines. Also, uh, it carried out demonstrations uh, linked to uh, subsidized inputs and other programs. Uh, also, um, CASI based demonstration and concept of innovation platforms has been built in the PMAMB, that's a, a Prime Minister Agriculture Modernization Project. Uh, towards the end of the project, uh, we held a number of meetings and discussions with the higher officials of the central government on the possible uh, policy conservation of CASI technologies. Likewise, uh, we engaged ourselves with the provincial ministry authorities. Uh, uh, local political leaderships, uh, and we talked about the possible ways of uh, CASI scaling, and uh, uh, they have promised uh, to say, set aside funds for CASI scaling and uh, carrying out the CASI scaling in the years. Uh, likewise, we had planned one national level policy dialogue uh, on CASI scaling on um, um, towards uh, May uh, 2019 but uh, that couldn't uh, be uh, implemented because of this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, likewise, uh, last year, we started uh, uh, carrying out uh, this uh, rice and mage uh, programs uh, in some of the selected local levels of province one and two, where we have uh, uh, prioritized the CASI scaling. Uh, this uh, uh, Center for Crop Development and Agro-Biodiversity Conservation, that's the CCDABC. Uh, this is the office uh, that uh, I'm heading now. And what we are doing this year, we are continuing this uh, uh, rice maize uh, program in local level, and also we have initiated a wheat program as well. Uh, we, the activities are focused mainly on uh, productivity enhancement and uh, value chain development. And in this um, program framework, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, prioritized the CASI uh, best mechanization, uh, like uh, demonstrations, uh, trainings, uh, uh, custom hiring center establishment, and subsidizing custom hiring services and mostly uh, machines uh, are being provided on 50% subsidy to open up custom hiring services and uh, uh, to get uh, service from custom hiring service. So um, now we see a lot of scope of CASI scaling uh, to increase the SRFSI impact that has been, that have been uh, you know, um, observed so far. So PMAMP, uh, has its uh, production pockets, blocks, zone, and super zone. And mechanization is one of the major thrust areas of PMMP. So there is a huge scope of CASI scaling within the PMMP framework. Likewise, uh, the local levels and provincial governments are also uh, focusing on agricultural mechanization. And there is a, a good opportunity for us to engage with the uh, these people, uh, the authorities there, and uh, uh, request them for setting aside funds to, uh, you know, uh, continue our 
uh, movement for cash scaling. Likewise, uh, there are many private sector service providers coming up, and we have to um, encourage them uh, for cash uh, best uh, service provision and the customer hiring services. Uh, so far, we've been uh, you know uh, focusing in EGB for cash scaling. Uh, but uh, since Nepal is mostly hilly terrain, so we see a huge scope of uh, cash intervention in the hills of Nepal. So in fact, to this effect, uh, I have already spoken to uh, some of SRFSI colleagues, and we were almost uh, you know, on the verge of uh, applying for SRF, SRFSI uh, a DFAT, in fact, uh, a DFAT SRA, SDIP SRA, but due to different uh, policy changes that couldn't uh, have happened, couldn't be happened. Uh, but uh, for all this uh, to happen, we need DOA needs support for capacity building uh, from CIMIT or for any um, other uh, related uh, agencies. Uh, and we have also uh, identified some of the critical actions for capacity building. Mostly they are um utilizing uh, mass media developing master trainers uh, extension worker trainers uh, farmers trainers and uh, developing and encouraging supporting private uh, and uh, community-based service uh, providers uh, likewise uh, more farmers uh, field days and field visits uh, exchange visits uh, are required likewise there is a need of uh, training manuals on CASI technologies and uh, CASI resource book development and wide circulation. So, uh, best of our experiences so far within this uh, SRFHA framework, a model has uh, evolved for the sustainability of CASI scaling. Uh, it uh, consists of five interlinked uh, stages, the awareness and sensitization, capacity building, policy supports, CA resource center development, and uh, for the sustainability uh, of this whole uh, CASI scaling endeavors, we need uh, institutional development. Uh, so finally, take home message. Uh, this uh, SRFSA uh, CASI uh, has been a good and timely in initiatives, but uh, uh, it's, uh, it, it has uh, heavily uh, concentrated itself uh, in research uh, in the beginning. And uh, so uh, let's focus on uh, capacity building and scaling. Uh, uh, we see a huge opportunity for scaling in days to come, but uh, we need to we consolidate uh, the achievements and outputs uh, we have uh, achieved uh, uh, through this SRFSA project. And especially we have to focus our programs targeting local levels. Uh, so to do all this, we need a separate national a policy and framework for CASI scaling. And uh, uh, to carry out all these activities, uh, we see there is a need of follow-up project and initiatives, uh, especially for the capacity building of the governments, the three tier of governments, central government, provincial government, and local government. So uh, let's join hands together for Cassie Scaling. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ram. And interesting, some of your, your takeaway messages, a lot of things we had planned if, if COVID hadn't interrupted that. So um, yeah, things to, to think about there in terms of um, how we uh, do adequately finish things in Nepal. Thank you so much. And thank you to all our presenters. We're going to have a quick look at SurfSea's top 10 highlights now before we move into a discussion. Um, hopefully this is uh, going to work. My computer is flashing at me a lot. All right, so this final presentation, we're going to try and unpack just how much impact we've had from SRFSI. So what we have here are the partner estimates of uptake in area and in farming implementations across the project. There's a few key, two in fact, key numbers. The first one 
is that there's about 40,000 hectares under CASI practices in 2020. The bulk of that is in surface seeding in wildlife. The second, in 2020, we were nearing 120,000 farmers who are using CASI practices across the region. What else do we know? Well, we can see that cash is being used in a diversity of crops and also that the majority of uptake is in West Bengal. Now, those numbers are impressive, but they also don't capture everything else that CERSI has achieved. Now, given we're a decade old, I'm going to throw back, bring back the PowerPoint animations to welcome in what I believe are the top 10 highlights of CERSI. And coming in at number 10 of Surfsea's top 10, we have the direct capacity developed. This is Nepal's national stadium. It holds around 20,000 people. Surfsea can claim to have directly trained enough people to fill the stadium three times over. Now that is a serious achievement. And in at number nine, we have the Center of Excellence for Conservation Agriculture at UBKB. Now, these two photos might not suggest that this is something impressive, but for me, it truly is, and for a few reasons. The first one is that the government of West Bengal sanctioned it, and ICAR sanctioned it, meaning that they can see the value here in long-term capacity development, and not just for West Bengal, but for the region and more broadly to the northeast of India. So this is something established that can create really long-term impact and no longer just for the project because the project isn't providing ongoing support. This is long-term potential to build impact for CASI across the region. Well done. And here we have number eight, innovation platforms. Now, it's not just that we were able to establish these innovation platforms, but it's also that we went to that next level to try and evaluate them, to learn more about them, and to make sure that the learnings that have come from innovation platforms are not just stuck in a project, but they're able to be known more widely than the project. And that in itself is an achievement. And coming in at number seven, we have the novelty of approaches. Now, from our surface long-term trials in farmers' fields to our novel theoretical frameworks, new methods, and even things like our photo voice survey, from the MOOC to the CASI visual syllabus, surface was not going to just do these normal methods, these normal approaches. We wanted to do something different. We wanted to get to that new level of meaning, and that's something that we should all be proud of. And at number six, we have our inclusivity focus. From the start, it was clear that Surfsea wasn't just going to look at development in isolation. It had to be inclusive development. Now, looking at opportunities for women in this region is something that can be very difficult. It's not the norm. But Surfsea took that on, looking at the quota system for training, looking at our intensive research focus on gendered issues of development, but not just that, we also looked at issues around uh, youth as well. But the fact that that plays such a crucial part in the project is something that we should really be proud of. And coming in at fifth of Surfsea's top 10 achievements, we have publications. Now, there's no doubt that Surfsea has been a prolific project for publication. It is massive more than 26 current peer-reviewed journal articles, books. By the end of the project, probably around 50 different peer-reviewed journal articles. Now that's impressive as a number, but it's not just the number. It's that they create this narrative that Cassie does belong in the EGP and here's what we need to do about it. And that's all the more impressive and creating all the more longer term impact because Surfsi was the pioneer of CASI in the EGP. We can't forget that this was an unknown before the project. So we've really built that evidence base and really anything, any CASI that happens in the region can be drawn directly back to Surfsi. So that's something that we should be really proud of. 
Lucky number four, what we have, convergence. So it's not just that we held these policy meetings, that we created all of this new knowledge. Our achievement is in the fact that we were able to convince government to change their policies. Now, particularly looking in West Bengal with the Department of Agriculture's custom hire system and then funding of the Conservation Agriculture Centre for Excellence. And also with the Climate Resilient Agriculture Program in Bihar. These are huge investments from government that came about because of our pioneering work on conservation agriculture in the region. And that means that our impact isn't just a project impact anymore, but it's going so far beyond. And that's something we should really be proud of. Coming in at number three, already our climate impact. Now let's remember, yes, we're a research for development project, but we're a relatively short term at our heart research program. Despite that, already in, our, in the span of the project, we've saved about 6,500 Olympic swimming pools of water. In equivalence, there's about 370,000 trees that are still taking emissions out of the air. And again, in equivalence, we've saved the equivalent of about 600,000 litres of petrol being burned and released in energy. This is huge in the life of a project. And for our second best achievement from Surfsea, we have farmer impact. Of course, Surfsea is primarily here for the farmers of the region. So what has Surfsea generated for them? Well, the first one, more than 2,000 trucks of extra yield generated for farmers. If we were to visualize a stack of $100 Australian bills. That stack would be 56 metres high in terms of money that is now in farmers' pockets. Importantly, that's a four to one return on the project's investment in the life of the project. And I think that's pretty impressive. We've saved the equivalent of 55 lifetimes of labour. And of course, as we saw throughout the presentations that labour is reallocated to even further economic benefits. And just as a fun little figure, the calories that have been created, well, that's about 141 million meals. That's pretty impressive. Well done, everybody. And drum roll, please, as we finish our top 10 countdown at number one, we have our collaborations and friendships. I don't think we should underestimate that this was a large, complex regional pro project that at times seemed never ending. It brought together 27 different organizations. And even by USA for Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation standards, that's a big project, pulling all those people together. But I think that here we are, a decade later, still celebrating, still smiling, still socialising together, still in contact with each other. And I think the reason for me why this is our number one achievement is because, yes, we had this great impact out of Cersei, but I think the relationships and friendships that we've formed are strong enough that it means that there's going to be much more impact in the future. And we just look at West Bengal, for instance, and the relationships between Department of Agriculture, between UBKB, and between all of the more local actors like Satmal, Sabuj Bahini Club, all of these actors. These relationships mean that our impact isn't just going to end now, it's going to continue, and our journey certainly isn't over yet. So in the YouTube lingo, like, subscribe, tell me what you think in the comments. But really, I hope this is highlighted what we should all really be proud of. This project is significant. Before Surfsea, Cassie was not in any way proven in the region, and now we're up to some pretty impressive impact numbers. So well done everybody, thank you for all your efforts.
All right, thank you everybody. Uh, the presentation was put together sporadically from my own personal opinion. So I'm sure everybody else has their various top tens and hopefully some of the discussion will bring that through as well. But for now, handing over to Robin to facilitate our discussion. Wait while I find the unmute button. Thanks very much, Brenda. That was a magnificent um, summary and presentation of, of the, your top 10. It, I'm quite happy for it to be your subjective top 10 and I'd love to hear from others. Um, clearly, you have an alternative career calling the Olympics. So we can give you a, a reference for that. <laughs> that was really a, a very uh, convincing set of presentations across all the regions of just how deeply Cassie is becoming embedded into the, the thinking and the policy approaches um, in the different regions. Um, so my, my job now, I guess, is to, um, to moderate a discussion and questions around that. Um, I see that we have one hand raised, but before I come to the open floor, I thought I would give the review team a chance to pose some questions. They've been uh, posing some very interesting points in the discussion as we've gone on. So Manahari, you've raised uh, questions about convergence between irrigation and agriculture, which I thought was very interesting, and about the role of local government. Would you like to follow up on those at all? Yes. Hi, Robin. <coughs> So yes, thank you so much. Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, let me congratulate uh, Brendan and all team, entire uh, partner and respected partner, uh, all countries. Really great achievement. <laughs> yeah, I don't repeat what uh, Robin said, but my my input is uh, coming from Nepal. Uh, yeah, the Dr. Ramsar already highlighted Nepal situation is de very different than other country, which is also very opportunity to see the how different country progress, uh, achieve the impact in terms of transforming food system in the context of climate change crisis, in the context of feminization agriculture, in the context of uh, political transformation. So in that context, what I see is that uh, I get, uh, it will be really important to see the role of local government in terms of not only the technological part of it, more on governance, system standing part of it, of any technology that scientists, we scientists and development practitioners want to test, pilot, and scale out. So institutionally, three government, as I see, there's some sort of role for local government in West Bengal and Bihar is more on information dissemination. It just started because we may not consider this local government, bringing local government at the front line of the stakeholder in the thinking. In future, this has to be very much focused, I think. Because Nepal context is very different than other, as I said, local government has, as Sir, Dr. Sir, Sister Sir mentioned, local government, uh, agriculture extension services, irrigation, watershed conservation, and market has been devolved constitutionally. Although there is a three tiers of government, but role of government, local government is huge. But as, as our presenting lesson learned from Nepal clearly reflect that there is a gap, gap in terms of policy, in terms of uh, standard, in terms of even understanding CASI. So I see this is great potential. Uh, second point is that um, in terms of uh, um, my question was uh, you know, um, with this uh, market, uh, private sector and market, but we can also discuss later. And I see agri mechanization, machinery, definitely there are there, there are good partners, there are private sector, but how to make private sector more proper gender inclusive when you design any technology, does this technology really uh, address the need of the smallholder farmer and women farmer? This is one point. Another is that based on, again, Nepal context, I've not been to the Bihar, but you know, private sector are very much centralized, very city center based, but 
if you go to the irrigation and irrigation agriculture services based private sector in down local level and there is a hardly the people so farmer are claiming that their needs some we don't have a service provider who can be reached when needed so this is the point and then food energy in access, I just, uh, I can discuss later, but what I observe is that in our agro input package, definitely is an aggregated package, but still I see the irrigation, energy, water and access very important because energy, when you talk of the energy, I mean here is the climate resilient energy technology, so, such as solar irrigation, although this project is not much only the technology irrigation, but part of irrigation technology, but look at the scenario of climate change, look at the drudgery and also feminized agriculture. We need to think of how to make women as a technician, value chain owner, machine owner, and also leader of the water uh, food system uh, transformation processes. So yeah, this is how my reflection is. Thanks very much for that, Manahara. Um, rather than going to the team for response, I might go to the other two reviewers first and then come back for a, a collective response. So Dr. Hamid, I see you're, you're there poised, ready to go. You raised an interesting point about the relative uptake in different areas. Would you like to follow on? Yeah, from thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I also like to thank Dr. Brandon again uh, for his excellent presentation and summarization. I think it's clear that this 10 point uh, uh, gives a clear picture of the, of the entire project. The uh, project is basically for the, for the generation of technology and uh, 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 testing and validation of technologies and also uptake. The third phase is basically for the, for the uh, uptake or adoption of the technology. My point was that the technology adoption differs in uh, among the regions as well as the as well as within the region. For example, Russia here and Rangpur, if we compare. Similarly, okay. uh, uh, West Bengal and Bihar, if we compare, it, if we understand the presentation and the documents correctly, then there are differences. I was not sure until yesterday how West Bengal is progressing or how, what is the position of West Bengal. Today, I am clear that West, I, my assessment is that the, the uh, becoming a uh, champion, I would suggest that, <laughs> becoming champion of West Bengal in implementing Kasi technology is perhaps the major, major, major responsibility of the government policy and government motivation. So that should be, Maybe there are differences in the political system, social systems, and also in the in the organizational setup. But I think that thing is not very much uh, highlighted, or somehow uh, it couldn't be done in Bangladesh and also in Nepal. That is perhaps the major reasons of differential adoption in the in the regions and inter-region differences. The number one, the, the third thing, second thing, I believe the project had the experimental results and also publications, but it has not been adequately highlighted is the climate change aspect. Conservation agriculture is, is an important tool for combating or adopting climate change uh, issues. So what we, what, maybe it's too early for the farmers, but it should be well, more, more time for understanding the policymakers and the governments that the climate change is uh, bringing a devastating effect on our agriculture and the livelihoods, particularly in the coastal regions. So what I believe that this climate change, there are some experimental evidences that uh, the uh, GHG emission is reduced, energy is safe, then labor of course that is an important issue in, agriculture both in Bangladesh and, and Nepal. I don't know about Nepal, also in India. So if we can provide, provide machinery, there will be a lot of success in adoption of the technology. But problem is that how these small farmers can gain the access of machinery. Is it, is it the availability of machinery itself or there are some other factors 
the, the uh, project has documented and had a lot of surveys and I think the, it's a uniqueness, I, uh, uh, it's a novelty as, as Dr. Uh, Brendan claimed. It's, it's true that it, there are some unique analyses that, that could definitely help us understanding the socioeconomic and, and the socio-ecological or political factors also that hindered or enhanced adoption of technologies. Then, then I think uh, I, one particular case I, I want to mention that my understanding, I might be wrong, my understanding is that the, the uh, Department of Agriculture Extension is less involved in, in, in uh, uh, taking this case forward. Because the, I, I, even I, today, I don't see any of the representative from the Department of Agriculture, but eventually, when we take it uh, as, a, as a program nationally, and if we can mainstream this program nationally, in that case, Department of Agriculture should take the lead. So I, I don't know why the, the agriculture department is uh, left or uh, somehow escaped. I'm, I'm not blaming anyone, but somehow there is a mismatch in, the, in, in getting those people together. I, I, I acknowledge that there have been tremendous efforts in bringing many organizations, uh, both private and public sector organization into the fold. So I, uh, congratulate everyone. I, it's, my, it's not my criticism, but some of my feelings and also to, to learn more about the, the problems and constraints that the, the, far, the, the implementers faced. And also we must look forward for how to go, go ahead with this program. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you very so much for those reflections, Dr. Hamid. Um, Dr. Ranjita, would you like to Give us some thoughts or some questions. Um, you, you raised some interesting points about labor displacement and alternative livelihoods. Would you yeah. like to follow up on those? Thanks, Robin. Um, and first of all, congratulations to Brendan, the whole project team. Excellent set of presentations again and great achievements. I'll just focus, I mean, my colleagues have uh, asked most of the questions and mine were, some of mine were in the chat. But I'll just focus on a couple of questions focused on um, impact and um, the policy side of things, uh, policy engagement. So, I mean, uh, sort of building on what Professor Hamid said, uh, the, the conservation agriculture is, is also all about, you know, helping build resilience to climate change. So when we are looking at the impact, or we are looking at adoption quite in, in, in quite a detailed manner, which is fantastic, looking at some of the impacts. But are we, is there an effort to try and look at whether we, we are able to, or, or these technologies are able to reduce the vulnerabilities of these farming households and individual farmers, men and women, in, in these places where we are working? And then the other thing I'm very curious about is, is about, you know, what we have learned about policy engagement. We've learned, I mean, some of that from this excellent presentation from West Bengal, you know, about the process itself. It's not just what policy, but, but then, you know, engagement with the agricultural advisor uh, to the CM field visits by him and the district magistrate. We've heard about policy briefs, field workshops in, in, in Rangpur. So my question is, what have we learned about how to engage policymakers to influence policy and policy changes? Um, how do we identify those policy windows or, or opportunities? in the different contexts, recognizing that the context, political, social, the, are different and how we engage these people could also be quite different. What kind of evidence are they responding to? Is it enough just to say, hey, if we did this, the yield is going to increase so much and you know the income might increase so much, is that enough? And how are we communicating this evidence? Our face-to-face -face meetings, are uh, more effective than any other form of engagement. 
Um, so I think it would be useful to reflect on those a little bit, you know, and then how do we do this? If we want to go beyond these project sites or these beyond these project state and try and do something similar elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, rather than go, because I can see we're very short of time, rather than go back to the project team immediately, um, there are three people with their hands raised. Um, Tapame Da has had a hand raised for a long time, so you get first question. Please go ahead. Thank you, Robin. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to uh, highlight some a few points on uh, Ranjita's query that what are the contextual factors uh, actually triggered the autonomous adoption of rice transplanter in Malda. First of all, in Malda, actually, uh, our system is a rice rice cropping system. So there is a, a larger scope to extend the uh, this technology in uh, borosism. And the farmers uh, in borosism had substantial adoption of rice transplanter. Number two, uh, in the mid of the project, actually we took a very hard decision. The project team from Mala, we took a very hard decision, including the government officials and the service provider, just to converge the flagship program in a particular village or locality only one time for showcasing the benefit of the technology and not to repeat such programs here and again in that particular uh, locality so that the autonomous adoption uh, may be high. Uh, and last and most important point is that you know that uh, in the mid of the project in 2016, uh, the government of India suddenly announced wheat holiday uh, in a uh, few districts of Ma uh, West Bengal, including Malda, due to the spreading of wheat blast disease in neighboring Bangladesh. Uh, and the wheat is the second largest uh, occupied crop uh, in terms of coverage in Malda, and it is very easy to adopt wheat under CA. Uh, so uh, we have faced a big challenge how to uh, outscale uh, the CASI technology to other crops and we have concentrated only on mage for zero seed drill so that the adoption under zero seed drill is slight uh, lower in Malla but we have accommodated uh, this technology through no tillage surface seeding in mainly in oil seeds and pulses in uh, different localities, localities of uh, the district uh, and there is no actual support uh, from the or any flagship program under the surface seeding of these uh, oil seeds and pulses from the government uh, and this is a complete autonomous adoption uh, by the farmers which triggered by the uh, project people. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much for those reflections. Um, Brendan has given me permission to go beyond the bell for a couple of minutes. So we've got three more questions. I would ask Farid and then Dr. Ramdat and then uh, Kuhu just for a very brief question or reflection from each. So, so Farid first. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, first of all, I would like to say great, I um, mean, the big congratulations for this big bash team. Really a very great achievement and uh, set up uh, very nice presentations. Just from the last slide of uh, Brandon, I just would like to just, uh, I, I'm just a bit worried. The last, uh, the top, uh, number one achievement of the top fence is just uh, uh, the collaboration. So uh, my query is, is that uh, consistent with your uh, objective? Usually we see that that sort of objective uh, was the bypass, the kind of byproduct. But here, uh, this is the main uh, number one. Uh, though we, we, we expect that number two should be the number one because at the end of the day, we see whether, uh, uh, what about the farmer's uh, return. So if this is the case, then what is the future uh, plan to capitalize these uh, collaborations to uh, make the final, uh, farmer's return uh, in future? Thank you very much. 
Thanks, Farid. I'll go very quickly and say my response is philosophical. The project ends now, and it's great that we've had this impact, but the collaborations we have will go on into the future. And we do have, uh, we're very, I think we've confirmed a, um, a partly follow on project as well. So that's why I made the distinction there. Okay. And certainly from ACR's perspective, the partnerships are a really important part of what we're investing in. So thanks very much for that very interesting question. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, Ram Dutt from uh, Bihar. Uh, so uh, this is a, uh, at the outset, thank you very much. It was a nice presentation, in fact. In continuation, I would like to add uh, Hamid's uh, discussion regarding the variation of uh, adoption of Kasi. So I would like to mention specifically here about the Bihar. Bihar is the only single state in this country who funded 60 crore INR rupees uh, for uh, conservation agriculture. And this is not a program. Honorable Vice uh, uh, Chief Minister of Bihar stated that this will be kind of permanent program until unless the whole state will cover with this Kasi. So all 38 districts we are covering with this. Not only we are struggling like uh, Bang uh, Bengal is struggling to go for south so at a mo one time they uh, just uh, implemented this Kasi technology across the uh, 38 district and uh, that uh, Bill Gates uh, uh, came and he uh, praised very much about the chief minister he is the man who started this kind of mega project the first time so this is uh, for Bihar and uh, not only this program we have this CSV program which is again 25 crore rupees and the first time Bihar government is funding to CG Institute about the cement ERI that is a visa so this is the first time is happening that any state government is funding to uh, CG institutes. So this is a correction from my side. Thank you. Thanks very much for that uh, clarification. That's really excellent news. So I think it's very appropriate that the last word should go to, to Kuhu. <laughs> to you, Kuhu. I, I will just try to uh, respond to Ranjita's uh, question about how to involve policy makers. See, for the policy makers, the farmers are a very large constituent. They are the vote banks. So when they get to the field and talk to the farmers and hear their views, that is the most convincing uh, act. They, from our experience in West Bengal, we saw that they got down there, talked to female farmers, male farmers, and they are, then the, it's not just the policy briefs that they also want to see. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kuhu. Well, Brendan, that's a very rich assortment of reflections and questions for the team. Would you like to um, respond in some way? I, I will ha hand back to you to respond and take us to the next, next session. Thank you very much, Robin, for uh, facilitating that. And thank you to all the presenters as well. Another great session. And that makes us five of six at the moment. Um, probably due to time, I won't directly reply to anything, but say um, we've taken everything down on notice and we'll get back with some, some more complete answers. I must admit we have stolen five minutes of the tea break here so that we can stay roughly on time and still finish on time. Please use the next 10 minutes to, uh, to get a cup of tea and whatnot, but also if there's anybody you say that's not on the call, that's been part of Cersei. Just encourage them to connect because the next session is really about, uh, it's, it's more open. We've got the reviewers asking some questions and then we have a completely open forum for everything that we that you think about Cersei. And it's a longer discussion. So please encourage everybody that's been part of Cersei to join that. But for now, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>